I'll start then. Um, so the title of my talk, once again, is Willful and Authenticity in the Francophone Caribbean, Rereading a Bad Faith Narrative. And I'll begin with a quotation from Professor Lewis Gordon. In his Bad Faith and Anti-Black Racism, Lewis Gordon writes, and I quote, all human beings face the ironic situation of human reality. To avoid bad faith is to be in bad faith. To cling to good faith is to be in bad faith. To flee oneself is a form of flight. To accept oneself as a being who flees himself is also a form of flight. What can one do? Gordon asks. He goes on to cite the Sartre of being and nothingness. And I quote, this is Gordon citing Sartre. If it is indifferent whether one is in good or in bad faith, because bad faith reapprehends good faith and slides to the very origin of the project of good faith, that does not mean that we cannot radically escape bad faith. Let me just repeat that last bit. That does not mean that we cannot radically escape bad faith. But this supposes a self-recovery of being which was previously corrupted. This self-recovery we shall call authenticity, the description of which has no place here. That's South on authenticity. While we know Sartre very well on inauthenticity, he actually said surprisingly little about authenticity. And just to give you a sense of my talk in a nutshell, um, my overall argument is that Mayo Capicia, this um, narrator I'll be talking about, gives us an idea of what authenticity might mean. Or rather, more properly put, she gives us, gives us an idea of what living something other than an inauthenticity might look like. And in short, what it looks like is something paradoxical, paradoxical and unstable. So who was Mayotte Capicia? What did she write? And why should we care? Mayotte Capicia was a Martinican woman, a woman of color, as she put it, and not a black woman, as uh, Franz Fanon termed her in his book, um, Black Skin, White Masks, which we've already cited a few times here. She was a Martinican woman of color who would fall for a dashing French officer, have a child by him, and be abandoned by him, then go on to move to Paris to pursue a new life. First, however, it is key to point out that Mayotte Capicia was not a human being. She was the pen name of another Martinican woman, Lucette Cernus Combat, whom I will be calling Lucette Cernus, um, just because it's shorter from here on out. The critic, Christian Macward, was able to discover that Mayotte Capicia was the pen name of Lucette Cernus, who, in turn, was born in 1916 in the Carbi, a commune in Martinique, and deceased um, in 1955 of cancer in Paris. But we must be cautious in tracing the history of the author and the narrator. There was a conti continued slippage between the two, as the author cast herself at times and was cast by her editors and collaborators as the narrator. Similarly, the narrator drew her legitimacy from, from an embellished, version of the author's life story. That relationship could, of course, describe any autobiographical text, from St. Augustine's Confessions to Rousseau's, but things proved to be perhaps even more complex in the case of Mayotte Capicia. And once again, just to clarify, we have the real embodied author, Lucette Cernus, who wrote under the, the pseudonym Mayotte Capicia, and we also have Mayotte Capicia as the narrator and protagonist of her purportedly autobiographical novel, called Je suis Martiniquaise, which will be the focus of the present analysis. And that's the first book that's listed in italics um, on the handout. The character Mayotte, and the presumed author of her two texts, is told by her mother that she was born shortly after her father left to fight in World War I. So presumably, this would be somewhere between 1914 and 1918. Her father was one of the thousands from the Francophone Caribbean who would pay what was called their blood tax, that is, they justified, in the eyes of the French nation-state, the gift of citizenship by fighting for France. I would like to sketch very, very briefly what little we do know about Lucette Cernus before passing on to her works. She was of working-class origin and did have affairs that led to children whom she very proudly raised out of wedlock. She did, of course, write two books, although, once again, her exclusive authorship, as we shall see, is unclear and debatable. Once again, we have those two texts that are listed there at the uh, top of the handout. For the first, which made her literary name, she won the Grand Prix des Antilles, so the 
let's say, the um, major prize of the, uh, of the Caribbean in 1949, which carried along with it a hefty cash prize. So it would have been something very meaningful for someone from her background. After her two literary successes, Lucette Sarnus fades into obscurity until her death. Aside from interviews with her family and descendants, almost nothing is known about the author. Both Capicia's novels highlight the way that class status complicates racial identity. Class issues give another clue that Lucette Sarnus, Capicia, and her characters are distinct entities. Mayotte, the narrator, is clearly intelligent, but has no scholastic ambitions. Reading is not a hobby of hers as a child. She prefers outdoor pastimes. She drops out of school around age 14, yet the autobiographical novel, which is presented as her work, is written in an impe in impeccable literary French. Throughout this work, Mayotte the narrator speaks with a pronounced Martinican accent, which she is unable or unwilling to shake, even when her white French lover tries to correct her speech. Living in a rural village surrounded by people who spoke non-standard creolized French, or quite simply Creole, Mayotte is a character who would have not had the opportunity to assimilate standard French when she was growing up. So already we see that there is good reason to believe that she was not the actual author of the book. Thanks to the eroticized exotic image of women of color propagated by the travelogue genre and the roman colonial, or the colonial novel, what the white male audience wanted and expected to hear from Capicia was a titillating story that satisfied their image of the islands as a garden of sensual delights, chief among these being the favors of women of color and their tropical passions. Thus, Capicia ostensibly offers the sensuality of an island woman on the initial pages of both novels. Mayotte begins by describing how she was motivated to take her first steps by greed, and I quote, my mother dangled a bunch of bananas in front of my mouth. I tried to reach them because I loved them. I truly believe it is by greed that I learned to walk. The toddler reaches for the bu sorry, reaching for the bunch of bananas grows into a woman whose gourmandise is not just for food. Similarly, the first pages of La Negresse Blanche elaborate on the protagonist Isol's skin in comparison to various tropical fruits. And I quote, she was a mixed blood like there are so many in Martinique. Her skin held glints of banana, orange, coconut, and coffee." Unquote. Both texts are laced with lush descriptions of the tropical landscape and meticulous details of preparing Martinican culinary specialties, which arise directly out of the travelogue tradition elaborated by Duterte, Laba, Moreau de Saint-Méry, and Lafcario Hearn, among others. And now just to briefly summarize the plot of Je suis Martiniquais, which once again will be the principal focus of, uh, of my talk. Throughout the novel, there are a set of amorous episodes. Uh, Marie's, uh, Mayotte, excuse me, Mayotte falls for her curate. Then for a dark-skinned young man, she describes as a typical Martinican. That sequence of amorous episodes culminates in her love for André, a white French officer working under the Vichy regime in Martinique. He fathers a child with her and subsequently, quite likely because of that fact, leaves Martinique, corresponding with her by mail and attempting to send her money. Mayotte goes on to live in Paris, free of Martinique and engrossed in writing her supposed memoirs. Now for a few things about the narrative, so the book itself. Um, first, the title. It was published in 1948 as Je suis Martiniquaise. It's hard to translate into English. It would translate as something like, I am Martinican, but with the added gender connotation. connotation. The French gendered active adjective, so I allows the title to read something like, I am a female Martinican, without really saying so outright. Next, there was a notable disjunction in the reception of the text. The book was packaged as a novel, but received as an autobiography, truthful and clear. On the advertisement strip attached to the book was written, I quote, for the first time, a woman of color tells about her life. This text, in other words, claimed itself to be the first narrative in French by, written by a woman of color. As Duby and Coutia point out, and they're in my list of uh, references here, with her fame, Mayotte began to mix with celebrities in Paris, names that we all know, such as Josephine Baker, Richard Wright, Léon Damas, and Henry Miller. Her lover, 
A Protestant, and a fervently religious one, also wrote his version of their affair, which he subsequently mailed to her. It was entitled God is Love, and was a 300-page religious justification of his decision to carry on a torrid and forbidden affair, and then to go on to abandon the object of his affections. <laughs> It mingles racy details of intimate encounters with novelistic flourishes. The white officer would have mailed the manuscript to her between 1943 and 1945, including a table of contents, numbered pages, etc. It already looked very much like a book, and it was no doubt intended for publication under a pseudonym. Christian Mackwood posits a host of white ghostwriters for um, Mayotte's text, but what we do know is that Je suis Martiniquez is an amalgam of writings. First, those done by Lucette Cernus. Next, there was extensive input and outright composition on the part of her editor at the Correa Editions publisher, named Edmond Bouchy. And then finally, much was borrowed from the text entitled God is Love, once again written by her former lover. So in short, much of Mayot Capicia's descriptions of herself and her life are lifted from a wayward lover's writing, from his writerly gaze, and from the imagination of at least one other white French male. Now, for the attacks on Capicia, why was she so troubling to Fanon and others? First, I'll read two citations by some of her more vehement critics. Uh, the Fanon of Black Skin, White Masks writes, One day a woman named Mayot Capicia obeying a motivation whose elements are difficult to detect, sat down to write 202 pages, her life, in which the most ridiculous ideas proliferated at random. That's Fanon on Capicia. Um, now for Léonard Bainville, who had an, an anthology, which he called an anthology of Negro African literature. Um, in 1963, Bainville writes, in brief, Je suis Martiniquez is a detestable book. If we have spoken of it, nonetheless, it is because we wanted to give here a sample on the literary level of the profound and for some incurable wound which racism engenders. So, Capicia's text is included in Banvi's anthology, not on its literary merit, but rather as a symptom of the facticity of racist and neocolonial society. Yet, what is at stake for Banville, Fanon, and other critics who objected to Capicia's supposed lactification complex in the book, is the issue of mauvaise foi, or bad faith, where Capicia supposedly works to whiten or lactify, as Fanon puts it, herself and others of her race. To take up only one instance of her so-called lactification complex, as she works to justify her unrequited love for her young blonde priest, she holds, and I quote, if my mother had married a white woman, I'd be white. I decided that I could only love a white man, a white with blue eyes, a Frenchman. Thus, for Fanon, in turning to white lovers, Mayotte refuses to accept the necessity of being what she is. Fanon condemns the Mayotte Capicia who relates her story in Je suis Martiniquez as in fact incapable of love. And Fanon writes, and I quote, for the beloved should not allow me to turn my infantile fantasies into reality. On the contrary, he should help me to go beyond them. Most importantly, the, ins the insinuations that Mayotte is engaged in self-deception and that the narrative is, for that reason, inauthentic are accusations that the author was acting in bad faith and, once again, lying to herself. I will argue now that while Capicia's narrators are certainly unreliable, their bad faith is actually an ironic device that she man deliberately manipulates. That strategy actually had its parallels in the work of male writers of the time, who, to varying degrees, associated, sorry, who were to varying degrees associated with the Negritude movement, and who often made ironic commentary through the naive adolescent narrators of their Bildungsromans. Oh, now on written, written slash spoken speech, as I'm putting it here, or Mayotte's Martinican accent. Throughout the work, Mayotte, the narrator, speaks with a pronounced Martinican accent, which she is unwable, unable, or once again unwilling, to shake, even when her lover tries to force her to do so. She rep represents it as a deformation of French by dropping all the R's from French words. This ersatz dialect matched stereotypes of Martinicans who swallow the R's, and Fanon once again made reference to them in his essay, 
on the Negro in language and black skin white masks. Now on to Capicia uh, as subversive. Given that the author of Je suis Martiniquaise has been confused with the text narrator, and given that the reception of the text has long been conditioned by Fanon's scathing reaction to it, how might we approach this text and its foregr foregrounding of bad faith otherwise? If we are to take Capicia as being more than the representation handed down to us by Fanon, we must first look into how she might have sought to signal to her readers that her text was not autobiographical. Je suis Martiniquaise, I will argue, could not have been authored by a person named Mayotte Capicia. Importantly, nor could it, could it even have been authored, in the traditional sense of the term, by Lucette Serranus. By traditional sense of authorship, I have in mind what Foucault calls the author function in his essay, What is an Author? In short, Foucault shows that rather than being a person, the author has, or rather is, a function. The author is what Foucault terms the principle of thrift and the proliferation of meaning. In other words, Foucault provides a response to the schema wherein an author is seen as one person with one more or less defined set of stylistic and thematic concerns and who produces one unified and clearly delimited text. Simple enough, it would seem. But the case of Capicia is much different. First, Mayotte was completely outside the academic system. In real life, if I may say, a character like Mayotte who arrived in France on a cargo boat would have ended up in a menial job, such as one in food service, practical nursing, or domestic work, as many immigrants from the Caribbean at the time often did. What is more, Lucette Cernus had a great deal of trouble writing in the French language. As we can see in her notes, she was actively working on her conjugations and was experimenting with different Baroque or antiquated formulas as she wrote. What is more, the book was published in 1948. If this were truly an autobiographical narrative, Mayot could not have even gone to France until 1946, after the war was over. Even with great native intelligence and diligent study, it is highly doubtful that a young woman of her background could have produced a prize-winning literary work in the space of only two years. Tellingly enough, Fanon damns her as what he calls une romancière éclaboussante, the translation mudslinging novelist does not quite capture the implied accusation that Capicia is a liar. Banville, in turn, also bristles at the abundant inaccuracies, what he terms inaccuracies in the text. Interestingly enough, both Fanon and Banville fail to pursue this accusation because they, like the majority of Capicia's readers, somewhat surprisingly make the mistake of taking this auto fictionalized autobi autobiography literally. That said, it is clear that Capicia is lying and pandering to her audience, but she did so with a de deliberate artistic purpose. Capicia fooled her readers so thoroughly that two years later she was able to sell them yet another novel about a black woman who loved white men, entitled La Negresse Blanche. Isa, the protagonist of this novel, frankly admits to employing the strategy refined by her slave ancestors of lying to whites in order to, in order to exact revenge. Twice in the novel, Isa tells such strategic lies, yet readers have rarely realized that the author herself was also deliberately lying to them. The critic, Clarisse Simra, recognizes the strategic value of lying in Cajou, the work of Capicia's literary descendant, Michel Lacroisier. Zimra argues that in that novel, and I quote, the relationship between white and non-white has become a compulsive game of deceit, where, in a startling reversal of roles, the latter comes to have the upper hand, unquote. Yet it was Capicia who had pioneered this technique. An excellent example appears at the end of La Negresse Blanche, when Isar gains the upper hand over her white mother-in-law by lying to her. Isar's husband, Pascal, has been killed by a band of rioting blacks. In order to salvage her own dignity and work revenge on her mother-in-law, who had always vociferously disapproved of her son's marriage to a woman of color, Isar invents a fictitious pregnancy. Since the child represents the last link with her son, the woman undergoes an, an immediate attitude reversal. Thus, if Mayotte does indeed manifest systems of what Fanon called a lactification complex, 
This is because Capicia deliberately constructed her novels as imaginative case studies of the psychology of oppression. Now I'll move on to how what Capicia was doing was a critique of the travelogue tradition and of Lafcadio Hearn, uh, more specifically. First, it is key to point out the wide currency of Lafcadio Hearn's Martinique sketches in West Indian literary circles at the time. Hearn wrote in, um, in English. He had actually sort of introduced the Francophone Caribbean to the um, English-speaking world, and his writings were rapidly translated into French. Yuma, which was written in the early 1890s, was translated into French by 18, sorry, 1923. Um, Esquisse Martiniquaise by 1924, Comte des Tropiques, 1926, etc. In light of that fact, in light of uh, Hearn's popularity in Francophone literary circles, it is remarkable that Capicia's frequent near verbatim gestures of intertextuality with various of Hearn's sketches have gone unnoticed. Why would Capicia have done this? In other words, why would she have sort of attacked Hearn by? Um, mimicking his work. As Fanon points out, the travelogue genre often justified the, clo the colonial project. In his chapter entitled Psychopathology in the Negro of Black Skin White Masks, Fanon demonstrates his awareness of the epistemological problems inherent in the travelogue tradition. Uh, quote Fanon, once he has described reality, the investigator can make up his mind to change it. In principle, however, the decision to describe seems naturally to imply a critical approach and therefore a need to go further towards some solution. Both authorized and anecdotal literature have created too many stories about Negroes to be suppressed." Unquote. The critic Joan Diane articulates a similar idea in her 1989 article entitled Caribbean Cannibals and Whores. There, she explains that all travel writing set in the Caribbean turned to voodoo out of a sense of threat from women's agency. She writes that, and I quote, exotic lands, coincident with the commercial dispossession of those lands, remained intimately tied to Gothic tales of power and submission. What do you do with what you do not know? A turn to both the Vodun tradition and the women writers of the Caribbean could lay bare the underpinnings of the male intellectual power structure and uncover where, in the name of Caribbean identity and revolution, it exploits and distorts the female culture that Vodun both sustains and preserves. There are, I see I'm running short on time. One other moment where Capicia echoes Hearn is in her frequent use of scenes of washerwomen, which are called blanchisseuses, bleachers, or whiteners um, in French. At one point, she even becomes one herself. She claims that people, as she puts it, are plowed to be bleached or whitened by Mayotte. So we don't have to look very far to, uh, to sort of suss out these metaphors. While Fanon might read that comment as a zestful lactification, we may also read it as a portrait of an active woman profiting quite literally from whites. Clarisse Simra once again unpacks that metaphor, holding that, and I quote, the imagery renders Mayotte's own consciousness. Standing the colonial pattern of exploitation on its head, she exacts a high bargaining price from the whites by exploiting their obsession with whiteness. The master-slave relationship seems reserved, sorry, reversed also, for se faire blanchir, in French, is a reflective form with a passive meaning. In this new racial dialectics, the whites are passive and the blacks active. Yet another instance in which uh, Mayo attacks subtly the, subtly the um, travelogue tradition is in her use of the doudou figure. Richard Burton identifies the doudou, and I quote, as the smiling, sexually available black or colored woman, usually the latter, who gives herself heart, mind, and body to a visiting Frenchman, usually a soldier or colonial official, and who is left desolate when her lover abandons her and returns to France, having, of course, refused to marry her though often leaving her with a child who will at least, and Burton writes, lighten the race. So that, in a nutshell, is the plot, once again, of Je suis Martiniquez. No, nevertheless, despite his sensitivity to the colonial context, Burton, like Fanon, reads Capicia's work as a symptom 
rather than as a critique of colonial pathology. Capricia's novel, he writes, Je suis Martiniquez, famously savage by Franz Fanon, might better have been entitled not Je suis Martiniquez, but Je suis la Martinique. So precisely does it embody the colony's morbid craving for possession by the blue-eyed phallic Frenchman. In other words, Burton is suggest suggesting that the female narrator of Je suis Martiniquez is not only an archetypal Martinican woman, but also the land made flesh. Now on to some of the critiques of Fanon's critique. In other words, how can we look at this text otherwise? Zimra is on the mark when she states that Fanon objects to Capetia's pandering because, as she writes, unwilling or as a male revolutionary unable to recognize that slaves and masters are equally victimized by the system, Fanon condemned Capetia for her pandering to the white man's ethnocentric conception of the self. Zima thus absolves Capetia of her putative bad faith, finding that, in Zima's words, this is not an insight upon which a crippled self can act. I'd like to move on to, to Dobi and Cotia's critique, it's again a famous critique, which is the first large quotation I have um, on the first page, which I'll read very quickly. In a sense, they're seeking to historicize Fanon, to explain that the sort of the, um, the real rage that Fanon would have felt towards Capetia, who once again was never a person um, in any sense of the term, had a lot to do with class status, um, subtle categories and shades of race within the colony, etc. I quote, how early a family's freedom was achieved, whether children were legitimate or not, economic status and skin color, all of these were criteria that conditioned personal status. Being a woman of color seems, in effect, to take on a new meaning through the publication of novels. The consent to domination that certain readers wanted to see in it comes closer to a maneuver to construct a subjectivity. Forced to avoid a head-on conflict with interlocutors who impose their own interpretations of what it meant to be a Martinican woman, but, at the same time, wanting to satisfy her own social ambitions, she had to find a compromise in order to meet her objectives. She had to accept certain humiliations or denigrations in order to move forward in a milieu in which she wanted to find a place and lay down roots for her family. Her writings, like her life, are marked by these complexities. Experiences lived by numerous colonial subjects, subalterns who have left few written and especially literary traces. Once again, those are the words of Dobi and Kutia. There are a few instances in which we can read uh, Capicia as an author who sort of en cachette clandestinely was in favor of Martinique independence. Um, we have this quotation here where she uses, in a context where you might expect to hear the word freedom, she uses the word independence. Keep in mind we are right in the wake of Martinique's becoming a French overseas department politically. Another example, I don't have time to go into it at length here, is a scene where her father attempts to fix a cockfight um, and is badly beaten for it. She goes on to explain how the sort of local foods and fish, etc., in Martinique can be used. Again, remember there's a naval blockade of the time, at the time um, of Martinique by the Vichy regime, so people are on the brink of starvation. That, in her view, is true national independence when the country becomes um, quite literally self-sufficient. Um, I will skip to my conclusion in these two, um, these two longer quotes that I have on my second page. I would like to recall that Sartre's idea of authenticity, which he near exclusively defines through negation in his discussions of inauthenticity, must not be reduced to an essence. Authenticity is not something that one can grasp and hold and subs subsequently become once and for all. Rather, one of the, if not the, key characteristics of human being is its, or is our struggle, with bad faith. And the case of Capicia can teach us much about how to conceptualize that struggle. Like the waiter or the flirt, Sartrean fictional case studies, we can see, in the case of Mayot Capicia, someone who is in the grip of bad faith. But her lived experience shows that bad faith's apprehension, and I'm returning to my quote at the beginning of the talk, Again, her lived experience shows that bad faith's apprehension, as Sartre puts it, is not final. 
Um, I'll skip to the quotation from Jeanne Souk now from her book, Postcolonial Paradoxes in French Caribbean Writing, where she writes, and I quote, the postcolonial has come to represent the idea of the margin made familiar by post-structuralism. How is this a paradox? That the abstract signs of theory could find grounding reference in the plight and people of the postcolonial world, world seems at once a somewhat anticlimactic relief and a disappointment. The, quote, dangerous supplementarity, unquote, of the in-between doesn't seem so dangerous when revealed to have been an allegory of a concrete situation. We have to ask, is Mayot Capicia doing her own theorizing, creating her own abstract signs of theory, as Sue puts it, as she confronts the lived experiences of bad faith and stages her own willful authenticity? I'll go on to uh, Dominique Chancé's uh, quote just below. Chancé writes that contradiction is germane to the Caribbean condition, for Chancé, and I quote, one of the terms that will no doubt return the most often over the course of this essay is perhaps the word contradiction. Contradiction is, it would seem, at the center of a universe where cultural tensions are extreme, where the shock of culture and races, of histories and languages, leads each person to be diglossic or bilingual, bicephalous, at times schizophrenic, always ambiguous. The Antilles, drawn taut between France and the Caribbean, between their diverse origins and their multiple cultures cannot but be contradictory. In conclusion, Mayot Capicia lives contradiction, lives paradox grounded in contradiction. As such, she shows that the human struggle with bad faith is much more complex than it might seem on Fanon's reading. But Mayot Capicia's work shows us that we can conceive of what is an other than Sorry, we can conceive of what is other than in inauthenticity as a negotiation, as a lived experience of paradox and contradiction, of which her story is but an extreme and a particular example. Thank you.